Hello everyone, welcome, welcome to another episode of Travel Alberta. Okay, we're here at Rocky Mountain House. This Rocky Mountain House, we are here in this side, a historical site. And then, we do camping over there. And then, this is the historical site of this Rocky Mountain. Okay, so let's check what's in here. Okay. There's a show over there. Canada again. There's a sh this town is a small wow. tiny town. Young David okay. considered a man so with here. work to do. Besides, he was in a whole new world with adventures around every corner. That's right. After all, what 14 year old wouldn't want the joys of an unexplored country? Not three them. Okay. The discovery! There's a show, okay? <laughs> the freezing winters with no central heating! Oh. The cold is so intense that rocks split with the cold with the sound like the report of a gun. How about this invention? I call it a paddle upside your big English head! Wait, wait! One last song to David Thompson? Ah, may we? Was broke. One, two, three, rest. Time goes on, we paddle along, moving westward, westward, ho. Sing a song to David Thompson, the man, the mouse, the hero. So take time out to tell the tale of the man who maps in great detail. Show Canada's rivers and her trails in the life of David Thompson. Heroes like Thompson, we can be. Follow these rules and count them three. Be fair, work hard, and love your country and the life of David Thompson. Time goes on, we paddle along, moving westward, westward ho. Sing a song to David Thompson, the man, the master, the hero. All right, everyone, the show is all about David Thompson. Here's the answer, okay? Just read it. Just read it, okay? Yeah, over here, okay? Right, that's the answer of the David Thompson, the show, okay? This is the National Historic Site of Canada, this Rocky Mountain. Okay, we are here. We should go to that gravity thing. And everyone, like that's that. it. This is the historical oh, site of hmm? Canada, Rocky Mountain Historic Site. like that, eh? All right. Can we get a selfie? Or... Um, you can. Um, we have some stuff in the gift shop, but uh, if uh, you see anything you like, we usually let it go for not that much. <laughs> um, it's because we can always make more, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's not my love. 
symbol of la flag so that's a good guess but yeah. these colors actually i kind of set you guys up a little bit these have no significance at all <laughs> they were just the most easily accessible colors of dye at the time oh. which is kind of funny because nowadays the hudson's bay company still uses these colors and they become such iconic symbols for the hudson's bay company mm. so um what do you guys think that these are so these are what are called points and what do you think they use them for <laughs> so this would be a sizing system. Mm -hmm. so this was how big the blanket would be. A lot of people assumed that it was like a pricing system, but the problem with that is that prices in the fur trade were very, very inconsistent. You could get two different prices from two different people at the exact same fort for the exact same company. So it really depended. Sometimes it would even depend on the mood of the person you're trying to trade with because they were very inconsistent. But of course, the bigger the blanket is, the more expensive it's going to be. So a four-point blanket, just like this one you guys see here, is like the size of a double mattress nowadays. And then six points would be like a queen, and eight would be a king size, which is kind of cool. And these blankets would be made of 100% wool, so they would also have to be shipped over from Europe. And we would make a lot of cool things out of these, like our jacket here. So this is what's called a coat or a blanket coat. Take it down for you guys. This is the Métis style of the coat. Some other styles could have used stuff like leather or beadwork in theirs, but this was the easiest to make and it was the most useful. So you can tell it's the Métis style because of our sash here that you can see here, the fringe on the side, and actually the hood on the back. So this was all to make it more waterproof and useful. So why do you guys think they would use a jacket like this over a fur coat? So, 
less expensive? Um, not quite because they would have to trade the furs for these. I think I heard someone say it. It's waterproof. Waterproof. Yeah, so these are a lot more waterproof. That's one reason. Another reason is that it would last a lot longer than a fur coat. It looks nicer, it's lighter, and then the final reason is that it doesn't smell as bad as a fur coat. So these would be very luxurious. This is our black bear. Now, we typically didn't try and hunt these guys too much either because we had these and they weren't as trusty as uh, any other kind of weapon could be. But if we did happen to get one, we could turn them into a really prized bear coat. Now, something we actually did with a bear's fat is that we would rub it all over our skin and it would act as natural bug repellent. But something gross about that is that after a few days, it would actually start to rot on your skin and you would start to stink. Um, but of course, they just wanted a break from those uh, pesty flies. You guys can imagine how many bugs would have been around with all these furs in a fort. Yeah. Now, I do have other presentations on the buffalo hunt, the Red River Cart in New York, but if you guys are interested, sure, I can tell you about our buffalo hunt. Okay, I'm just going to catch my breath for a moment. All right, so we'll start with this gun here. Now, during our buffalo hunts, they would have happened around two times a year, once in the fall and once in the spring, and that is how we would have gotten our main source of food. Do uh, you guys see that red flag right up there? That is called our blood flag. Now that was gifted to us by the Hudson's Bay Company and we would have used that flag to commemorate the hunt. So one leader would be chosen every year and they would basically control the hunt and control what happens during the hunt. Now there would have been around hundreds of families that come from all over from Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta to come to hunt all in one place. So it was kind of like a very large family gathering because that was around the only time you would have seen your family. Now, to start the hunt, let me uh, get on my fork here. So, <laughs> you imagine that this is your horse and the leader would have just put down his flag and that would have commemorated the hunt has started. Now what you would have to do to shoot one buffalo is that you would have to be galloping at full speed beside them. There's a very large herd. Back in the day, a large herd could have been up to millions and a small herd could have been up to thousands. So you can imagine trying to dodge all the holes in the ground, other hunters and other buffalo. Now to load a gun, you would have to take it from your side. With one hand, you'd have to pour in the perfect amount of gunpowder. If while well, you're running full speed as well, um, if you put too little gunpowder, then you wouldn't be able to kill the buffalo, but if you put too much, it would actually blow up in your hands. So, while you're riding a very fast horse, you're trying to pour in the perfect amount. Now, we kept our bullets in our mouths because we had nowhere else to put them. We didn't want to drop them accidentally, and they were lead bullets. So, <laughs> if the buffalo hunt didn't hurt you, the lead would have. But what you would have done is that you would have taken one of the bullets that were in your mouth, you would have spit it down the barrel, because of course we didn't have much other ways, and you would have hit it on the side of the saddle or maybe your knee like this, and then you would go down in one swift motion, shoot, come back up, load again, put a flag down to show that that was your kill, and then you would have kept going. Yeah. Was it a certain type of flag? Uh, no, sometimes it would have been a sash because okay. I'm not sure if you've seen that presentation yeah. over there. Yeah. Yeah. Every person, every family sash was its own, so it was very, uh, you could tell who's, whose kill it was by their sash, or maybe even a flag that had maybe uh, something to indicate your family, and that's what you would have done. And then the women and children would have come up around 15 minutes in and they would have brought their red river carts and they would take a they would take apart the buffalo take all the things they need put it on the cart and keep going and that's how we would have hunted our buffalo back in the day does anyone have any questions about anything well, I, sorry go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. no it's just about this floor what's the blue flag for okay so that blue flag up there that was gifted to us by the northwest company and it was basically gifted to us as a thanks it was basically that is our nation's flag. So when you think of the Métis, or if you search up the Métis, you will see that flag right there. Now, it was gifted to us as a thanks for helping them survive the winter, helping them trade, helping them do anything like that. Uh, and the red flag was gifted us to the Hudson Bay not long after because they didn't want to be one-upped by the Northwest Company. <laughs> so basically, it was a thing of pride more than anything. But now, 
Our blue flag is our nation's flag, and that red one is kind of a reminder of how we would have lived and uh, hunted back in the day. Did anyone else have any questions? Well, yeah, for because it sounds like loading the rifle was so challenging. Like what? Like what? A like when did they switch from like bow and arrows? And would there ever be hunts where there'd be like because there's so many buffalo where it would be like a mix of like mate like trap or like um, yeah. Um, I yeah, like white people and, and yeah. First Nations. So what I'm, well, I get you what you're trying to say yeah, there. Yeah. And so basically the Métis were basically born with our guns. So we wouldn't okay. have used wouldn't have the bone used arrows because uh, since our European fathers already had the guns when they came to uh, uh, Canada and stuff like that, we would have been born with them. So we would have been very used to that. Uh, the indigenous would have used things like buffalo jumps. Has anyone heard of the buffalo jump? Yeah. Good, okay. So they would have used that. They would have used bow and arrow. And actually something sad, uh, as you're talking about the people, like the fur traders that would have came, they actually would have killed the buffalo on site. So what the government did a long time ago was put a rule down, if you see a buffalo, kill it. So they would actually kill as many buffalo as they could and leave them to rot because they wanted to take away the livelihood of the First Nations and the Métis. So that was the government's way of trying to get rid of us. They thought if we, they got rid of our food source, that they could get rid of us. And that's why the population of the buffalo are actually so low, is that you would see fields and fields and fields full of dead buffalo because people would just ride by on their horses, shoot them and go, yeah. Anyone else have any other questions? So the cart was pulled by, by a horse? Okay, I can tell you guys about the cart if you'd like. All right. So that cart there was our Red River cart. Now that was designed after a French peasant cart. Now back in the day, it would have been pulled by something. If you see up here, we have a little toy there. He's called an oxen. So he's basically a, a type of work cattle. Now that guy would have pulled our things because he can pull a lot hard, like a lot heavier weight, a lot longer than the horses could have. But the horses would have rode alongside them. Now these are, were fully made out of wood back in the day. So the reason they're made like that is that so you could, pardon me, so you could, if you, broke a wheel or maybe a part of the thing during your journey, you could just go into the woods, take some things off the tree, carve it all up, and put it back onto the Red River cart. And something interesting, do you guys see the pegs on the side of the cart wheels? They could be taken off and put underneath the cart and then put a piece of hide under, and it could actually be pulled across water. So it's the first kind of a hydro vehicle that was ever made. They couldn't go into water it had to be pretty shallow and not very fast running though so they're made fully out of wood and you couldn't grease the wheels or else you would get dirt and build up build up in the wheels it would make this horrid squeaky noise that, we could, that was said to be heard from over three kilometers away so you could hear someone coming from a long ways now these carts could only go around 40 kilometers a day does anyone know where the town caroline is so it's 40 kilometers from Rocky Mountain House, and do you know what's 40 kilometers from there? No. Sundry. And 40 kilometers from there is Cremona, and then 40 from there would be Calgary. So highways 11 and 12 were actually old Red River cart trails. So most of the places we drive now is the places that we the Métis had made trails of. Yeah, which I think is quite interesting. Does anyone have any questions about the Red River cart? Why is that called Red River? Uh, it was called, it was named after the Red River Settlement. Okay. Now that is where the Métis uh, first started basically. It was a settlement in Manitoba and that's where all the Métis would have came from at the beginning. And I can tell you a bit about our York boat while I'm at it. Sure. So that is our York boat. Now this would have been used by the Hudson's Bay Company, not the Northwest. So this is how they would have transferred furs and other goods up and down the rivers. They would actually go upstream in these giant boats. So they would have enormous paddles and they would have had around 12 to 16 men on a boat at a time. And it would they could have taken months to get from maybe point A to point B. And something they did when they couldn't go any further was something called portaging. Does anyone know what that is? Okay, so portaging is basically where you would cut up a bunch of trees to make a clear path. And then what they would do is that they would take down the trees, put them on their sides, and they would roll the boat across the trees. And that's how they would have gotten from one, one place where they couldn't uh, put the boat in water to another. 
So if you can imagine from me to the visitor center, that they could have portaged that in around three to four months. That's how long it would have taken to go from here all the way to over there because they would have to clear out every single tree, smooth out the smooth out the ground and then put down the logs and then they would have to roll it across. Yeah, and so when they got to a destination, what they would do would actually burn the boats completely, and then they would take the uh, leftover metal that was inside the boats, and then they would make a brand new boat because of how much damage it would have gotten from, um, cause imagine going upstream in a giant boat where there's rapids, there's lots of rocks, it, got a, it would have gotten very damaged on the way there. Covered with spruce boughs that I collected from the bush, and then uh, continue on in my way in. So, it was more temporary than full time. So of course the big teepee here is made of canvas. It's the home of the indigenous person uh, for thousands of years. We still use them today. Oh. <laughs> I blame it on the squirrel. <laughs> he come over and said, I don't like that bike. <laughs> Drop kicked it from behind. I've seen him. He's crazy. Coming from the squirrel. Uh, so um, the, in the old days, the teepees were made out of uh, bison hides. And so they would take between nine and 15 bison hides in order to make this teepee. Wow. Uh, and it wouldn't be quite this big. It would be about half that size. When the Europeans come over, they started bringing canvas. And so we traded, we changed to a canvas teepee rather than a bison hide teepee. They were a lot lighter, more versatile. We could make them bigger. Um, yeah, they were easier to transport. On the far side over there is the uh, Red River cart. This one has a top over, uh, canvas over the top, the one at the Métis Fort that you just came from. They have one that has no canvas over the top. Yeah. So this one has the awning and, the, and canvas, and that was to cover our stuff. And we traveled a long ways in them. So when the little ones got tired, we could set them in the back if there was room. They'd have a nap and then get up, and most everybody walked alongside. They were pulled by oxen, uh, oxen, oxen, yeah, oxen. <laughs> and, um, and then they were a workhorse, but they also were accompanied by another horse that they had for hunting specifically, and that horse would not be used to, to pull their cart. Now that cart can take between two and 4,000 pounds, um, is what it can carry, and they float. And so if I ran into a river system, I would just pull the wheels off, take it mm. across the river, put the wheels back on, and then uh, continue on my way. Mm. A lot of the roads we have in Alberta today, uh, and through here, uh, were old, um, Red River cart roads. Um, so they just uh, grabbed them or paved them, and then now we use them to drive our vehicles on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The racks over there, um, those are the dry racks that we use for uh, for stretching and um, scraping the buffalo hides, moose hides, deer, elk. And that's how we would rope, tie them to there, stretch them out, scrape the flesh off. If we wanted to make uh, a rug out of it, we'd only do the flesh side. If we wanted to make a leather, then we or rawhide, which is what's on that trap wall. Uh, we will flip it over and take the hair off as well. Yeah, and so a lot of the stuff you guys see in front of me is what came from the bison, or a lot of the animals that were in the area that they were commonly following. So most commonly you'll see, uh, I don't think you touched on the bison robes, did you? So the bison robes here, as you can see, are very large, very heavy. And they were commonly used as like their blankets and their coats back in the day, just because of how the sheer weight and the warmth that they held. Uh, and so once uh, European tr uh, trade came through, they started to transition to more lighter materials. Uh, so that is like the canvas here that Warren was saying, is that the canvas was uh, used instead of bison hinds and other hides for their teepees. Uh, so the bison was also used uh, in many different ways, because uh, you didn't want to waste such a large animal. So right here, does anyone take a guess at what this is? What they're jug. Yeah, so this is a water bottle, but does anyone know what part of the animal would make the water jug? Bladder. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So the, this is the bison bladder. Uh, a really gross balloon as well, because uh, you have to blow it up a little bit before you put it in. So you basically would have a leather bag, uh, beside, or a, just a bag that would, uh, you dip this uh, underneath the water, and it would fill up to a certain volume, and it wouldn't break in that side of that bag there. And it was also used for uh, storing other items you didn't want to get wet or damp. So like tobacco, maybe some important stuff like tobacco or knickknacks. Uh, were a few, a few examples of some things you'd actually store in, in here. Uh, they'd also be using the bones of the bison because they were very large animals. So you could get really nice hide scrapers out of them. Uh, so you can see here the marrow has gone out of these bones here. And you could uh, sharpen these, file these down so that you can scrape hides just on those hide racks there. 
And from that you can get uh, rawhide, which is the stuff that you see on the part flesh here. So this stuff is super solid. So very hard. But it's and, uh, so that's a part flesh, so that's raw hide. So that's the process of uh, scraping all the fur and all the meat off the hide, but not uh, treating it. So I'm wearing tanned hide. So this is with a solution of brains and urine. That was a more traditional style. Nowadays there's a newer solution that smells pretty strong. So these are essentially the same item, but they're just treated differently. Uh, and so you wouldn't really want to wear that. That one's not comfy. Uh, so we wear uh, much lighter clothing. So this one here is like a... Uh, what would you say this one is? Just like a very weather worn, or uh, like a partial between the two? Yeah, it's kind of a partial. It's more of a harder, harder yeah. hide, so it's not worked as hard, worked as much. Yeah. And so it's a bit tougher. Yeah. So it's a bit tougher, but you can still see it's got it's it's got like the soft, like kind of look and properties to it. Uh, but it's not as uh, hard as that guy right there. Um, so you could also be making uh, well a lot of meat from the bison. So does anyone know what pemmican is? Yes. Yeah, so pemmican is the dried meat mixed with bison fat, just like this. So this would be boiled down to get to this. Uh, and mixing it with uh, berries. So these are Sask uh, Saskatoon berries that were mixed in. And they would crush them together on a rock like this. Mix them together, typically put it in a pouch or something along those lines. And it was kind of like uh, your fur trade cliff bar. It's very mm -hmm. dense in calories and stuff like that. So uh, it was very essential for basically traveling on the go and having a readily available food source so mm. and you dry them just on that drying rack just right there drying racks. yeah yeah and so uh you'd also be harvesting uh the hooves of the animals so these guys right here are the front hooves and so these were typically used as spoons Ooh. and the back hooves were kind of like on the back side there uh we're a lot smaller so but they were used uh quite commonly in jewelry and as smaller spoons maybe for infants but uh i believe there's some more right here just right there uh, their teeth as well used as uh, jewelry so you can see some there's some teeth jewelry in here uh, including uh, their bones uh, also maybe bone comb bone. right here so yeah there's a bone comb and this here is a uh, uh, close to that it's also a comb but it's uh, it's got rawhide in between so the rawhide when you wet it it's kind of like uh, unedible spaghetti is what I call it is that it forms and kind of gets soft like spaghetti but as soon as it dries up, it cinches up again. And so uh, that's how you can make these uh, combs here. And so now the big horns here, uh, commonly used as cups, or uh, more, more often than not used as powder horns. Uh, so they were commonly used to just stick black powder in for your muskets, you know, pour it in. Uh, they were also used to carry embers for fire. So they would actually stick embers from their fire in here, uh, put a piece of hide over it, and then wrap it around. And uh, they, would put, they would tap it every now and then, that would push a little bit of air into the embers. And this is kind of like what a modern cup looks like at the moment. So you see, they didn't, they didn't have the means to basically be able to do that, but uh, that's kind of an example of what they had. Uh, and they'd be also be scraping uh, the hides with these kind of scrapers here. So you see that this one is made out of flint, this one's made out of steel, so you know, pre-European contact, post-European contact here. Uh, and like that was including like making this, so this was a musket barrel. Uh, or musket holder, uh, and uh, that guy right there is actually a arrow quiver. So kind of like the two differences between uh, post-European <coughs> po uh, European contact and uh, pre-European contact. So that's just like the, uh, the TP here is post because it's canvas, and then pre as uh, the Sorry. and post uh, is the uh, is the spruce bow TP there. Where did he get some of these? furnace before? Inside the teepee or just just a fire that was that was your just furnace a before, yeah. 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 and so um, actually the teepee would actually be raised up a bit more mm -hmm. uh, so like a few inches more and there would actually be a liner on the inside because uh, what that does is it basically draws in air uh, from the outside and up and so uh, you would actually open these let the smoke flap and you would basically uh, let uh, smoke go up and through and uh, because of the air flowing through it would actually just float out like a kind of like a bigger uh, smokestack. But also not getting you super cold with that wind. So that fire in there was uh, really nice to have. And uh, typically you wouldn't have them in the, those guys right there. Right that's <laughs> that's like, you know when you make a teepee to make a fire? Yeah. That's essentially what you just did there. So mm -hmm. you don't really want to have a fire in those guys. But you could if it was, you know, if you were, if you were really, really needed. But other than that, you would typically have them outside. Or, mm -hmm. or um, if you had enough of these bison robes, you were really warm with those. So mm -hmm. more often than that, you would just bundle up in a bunch of those. Okay everyone, I will end up this video by saying thank you, thank you for so much for subscribing my channel and to all my viewers.
thank you for viewing my channel. All right, see you in my next video. Bye bye.